So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> One of the things uh, um, we'll be telling you more about over the next while is some of the ideas that the 200th anniversary committee uh, is thinking about and, and some of the activities and, and things we're going to do. But to give you a little hint, we have been researching the possibility of installing another piece of stained glass in, uh, in, our, uh, in our sanctuary here to celebrate our bicentennial. And the vision for it is it's beautiful. Because folks will they'll walk into the sanctuary on November 3rd, that's our big celebration day, and, and they will see this beautiful gift, this breathtaking installation in my head, uh, that will be a gift to the future generations that will worship in this space. Now, it's really important when folks enter this sacred space that they feel welcomed and that they feel safe, that it is a true sacred space. Now, right now, when you, when you walk through the doors of the narthex, which is the doors out there that come in from the outside, you see this big welcome banner that's been created by, by our Sunday school, and it's just over the, the archway there of the doors, and it says that we're better together, and it welcomes, and it's got all little drawings by them and their names. Uh, and, I, and that's your first welcome. And then hopefully, I assume, I trust, I pray that you are welcomed again and again as you, as you enter the space and you greet your friends and church family here. And we speak about holy spaces, but in reality, all we do here is hopefully curate a space where holy moments can happen. Because it's not, it's not about the space being sacred. It's about having a space that is reserved for sacred moments and sacred experiences. So think about it. You're coming in the doors of the narthex. People walk into our sanctuary. And what's the first thing that they see? I mean, there's, there's so much history and beauty in this space. But you walk in, and the eye is always drawn to what? The cross. And we are, you know, fortunately we've got it right there and in the window of our chancel. And it's the dominant symbol, not just of our church, but of every Christian church. And some crosses are very ornate, and some are just plain wood, and some have spotlights on them, and, and some are made out of windows. Many of us wear them around our necks. I got a, a simple wooden cross around my neck today. And it's not that we don't have other symbols. I mean, if you look on, on the pulpit here, we've got the United Church crest, which, which itself contains a number of symbols. We have our baptismal font. We have the our, our community Bible, we have uh, our communion table, our altar and our communion table here, and even the candles that are on the table are symbolic this time of year. That as in Advent, we light a candle because it gets brighter and brighter. During Lent, we, we extinguish a candle as it gets darker and darker towards Good Friday and the death of Jesus. So there are so many symbolic things within our worship space, but, but it's the cross that always stands as that dominant symbol of our faith. And it's a fitting symbol. And our scriptures point to the cross as really that defining moment in Jesus' redemptive work. It is the cross that is that bridge between God and humanity, like the illustration we did with the kids this morning. Maybe after the service, somebody will help me straighten out that tape. But we can't get to God on our own, no matter how hard we try, no matter how fast we run or how far we jump, we're never going to make it there on our own, no matter how hard we try. So God came to us in the person of Jesus Christ. 
And during Lent, the cross then becomes very dominant in our thinking. I mean, the cross is always there throughout the year, but during Lent and Easter, it is right there in our face, and it informs what we do or how we think about faithful discipleship, what that means. And it certainly informed what faithful discipleship meant to the folks in our gospel reading this morning. Because Jesus doesn't kind of sweet coat it, candy coat it for them. He says, take up your cross and follow me. And as Jesus is talking, he tells a lot of stories uh, and he uses a lot of parables and symbolism. But when he's saying that to his disciples in that moment, he's not talking metaphorically. He is talking about a rugged, wooden cross, an instrument of torture and death on which he was going to die. And so would many of Jesus' followers. Now one of the uh, downsides sometimes I've mentioned before about following the lectionary is that it jumps around a bit and, and sometimes we lose the context of our reading. So to really understand this particular portion of scripture, I'm just gonna back up just a tad and look at the story right before that. Because right before this conversation that we read this morning, there's this conversation uh, with the disciples the, regarding Jesus' identity or his full identity. A conversation where Peter has finally clued in that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. And we get the, the story of uh, Simon the fisherman becoming Peter the rock. So, so he, he realizes that Jesus is the Messiah and what good news this is. This is what the nation has been waiting for and there are going to be happy days ahead and it's time to celebrate. But then, then in our passage, Jesus gives him this, this reality check. He tells him it's actually not going to be all celebration and happy days, that there's going to be suffering, there's going to be rejection, and there's going to be death. Even though he tells them, you know, in, in three days I'll rise again. But the followers, they do not take this proclamation well. This kind of talk about rejection and suffering is unacceptable, and Peter tells Jesus that. He rebukes them for saying such things and th because they've been waiting for this day. They want the glory from the Messiah. They, don't, they want a great victory. They do not want a cross. It contradicts the image of the Messiah that they have been waiting all these years for. It is not the way they want things to be. And as they're having this conversation, I imagine Peter is annoyed and he's annoyed and gets angry enough that he actually tells uh, Jesus, his rabbi, his teacher, that he doesn't understand what a Messiah is supposed to act like. And, and the conversation where Jesus rejects Peter's vision and says, enough, get behind me, Satan. So imagine the tension. And that happens just before what we read. The Messiah thing it's serious business. The stakes are rising in the story. And there is an inevitable outcome to this ministry, this campaign that the, that the disciples are on. Yes, there will be resurrection and there will be glorification. But between Easter Sunday and now, there will be suffering, there will be betrayal and there will be death. So think hard, Jesus says. Do you really want to join me? Now hold that question for a moment. Because this passage is always a good opportunity to share some, some historical theological discourse, and we theologians live for these moments, right? We don't always uh, formally teach our doctrines, but it really is important to stop once in a while and, and, uh, and, and for us to understand why it is we confess certain things we say in the church. So, let me remind you about something I'm sure you all know, the Heidelberg Disputation. I can see it in your eyes, like, ah, oh, yes, 
that. So written in 1518 by Martin Luther, the Heidelberg Disputation discusses a contrast because between what is known, uh, this tension between a theology of glory and a theology of the cross. And it starts with a, a, the basic thesis that the only way to know God, who is unknowable, is to know God through the knowable, which is Jesus Christ. I mean, we followed that, that all makes sense. That's our basic uh, Christology of the incarnation, uh, the reason why Jesus, uh, why God came in human form. Now, a theology of glory prefers kind of an accomplishment to suffering. It prefers glory instead of the cross, and we'd all prefer that, right? But Luther, in, in his writing, contended that we know God only, only, through Christ. And Christ, whether we wanted it to be so or not, suffered and died. And that through that, that suffering and death, that is the experience through which we get to know God. That we don't get to see the glory without seeing the cross. Now, that, that's pretty simplistic way to put it, and there are all kinds of nuances to that, and, and uh, if you want to discuss it uh, further, remember Reverend Bill's doing that Bible study in March. But you hear the tension, right? You hear that tension, that God's strength and glory is exposed only in weakness. And what does that mean for us? Why, why do I bring that up? I bring it up because it means for us that during this season of the year, we don't get to skip the agony and the tears of Lent and Holy Week and just jump straight to the celebrations of Easter morning. It doesn't work that way. And despite how much I, I enjoy colorful eggs and chocolate bunnies, and I really do, we certainly don't get to skip Jesus in that altogether. You know, Easter, Jesus' death and resurrection raises questions for us uh, that sometimes make us uneasy, particularly in our, yeah, whatever we want to uh, believe is just okay uh, kind of world. It raises questions. And it raises questions that at some level and at some point we need to deal with if we call ourselves Christians. So, back to Peter. Peter's response to the foreshadowing of Jesus' death, it was immediate, it was dramatic, but it was really, really honest. Peter had his own convictions about what, what the Messiah should be, what the Messiah's agenda needed to be. And nobody wants to give up those expectations of, of kingship and power and victory and certainly not to trade it for, for suffering and rejection. Nobody wants to take up a cross. Even those of us who are just going to take it up metaphorically, we don't want to do that. And yet, there's something about Jesus. Jesus is just so very compelling that even with the stakes laid out before us, Jesus is just too compelling to turn our backs on, to dismiss, that there is more to eternal life than just the suffering of the moment, Jesus says. He says those who want to save their lives right in this moment will eventually lose it. But those who are willing to give up their lives or for us in the year 2024 to give over our lives for Jesus and the ministry of Jesus will in the bigger picture save it. And then our passage for today, it ends with a warning or maybe just a statement of fact. Either way, I think it's uh, important. Jesus says, if we are ashamed of him on earth, then he will be ashamed of us in heaven. 
And I suspect there is not a single person here that hasn't done something that they regret, something in life that you wish you could do over. There's regret, but then there's shame, and that's a whole lot heavier than regret. And I, I can't imagine anything more awful than to have my Jesus ashamed of me. Lent is our opportunity to think deep on these things. It is our thinking time in the wilderness, like, like our background picture today. Because here is where we are. We are baptized and confirmed followers of Jesus Christ. We have publicly professed that faith and every year at this time, we get the, the chance to think about the question, are we ready to take up that cross, whatever that cross is, wherever that cross leads, are we ready to take it up? Things to think about. Thanks be to God. Amen.